First of all, Donald, how do you know these guys? I met, uh, well, I, I used to come and see them play in various places, and I would say hello to them. But the first time I think I did something with, with Ron was um, the Tony Williams Project. And I think uh, really the first time we played together was in Brazil. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, that was the thing, yeah. We did a project with Larry Correo. Yeah. And then uh, off and on, we played together over the years until really put a project called The, the Art of Four together. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, when I, I had a lot of interaction with these esteemed gentlemen. Esteemed gentlemen. What, what, what does the word heroes mean? I with two of my heroes and uh, to interact in the trio mm -hmm. setting and, and to, to grow from there. Do you still like touring? I'm liking it less, not because of the tour in itself, it's that the travel is more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. you know, the airports put you through a terrible thing, the airlines don't allow the base to go inside the, ca inside the cabin or in the luggage. You know, they always bring the wrong size van to pick up the gear. I mean, it's just more and more difficult to, in getting from point A, point A to, the, to point C, which is the stage. Mm -hmm. You know, at point B, it's good to the hotel, you got to check in, you got to find the luggage, it's always late, the room's not available. I mean, it's these events mm -hmm. that make traveling difficult. Not to play in different locations, because I like that, man. It's like a, a free acoustic school for me. How does this, how does this hall work? How does this strange bass work? But the process of getting to have the experience is what's so wearing and, and, and so uh, damning. What's the blue note like to play in? Uh, what makes the blue note unique? It's one of the better places in New York in terms of not just size of the stage, but they have good sound gear. They have a, a sound man who works every night. You know, they have a dressing room. There are clothes for my coat that won't be on the floor every night. And they have good food if you want to eat. You've uh, been a teacher and been involved in, the, in a number of, and honored by a number of academic institutions. Why is teaching important to you in your craft? Why have, have you pursued that so much over the years? Well, like any teacher who thinks that they are a teacher, they teach because they have ideas they want to propagate to a bunch of to somebody else besides their grandmother. You know, they, they, want, they want to have some students who, who will be able to take this idea, this propagandized view, and develop it somewhere else. And, and uh, so that's one reason I teach. Mm -hmm. Uh, secondly, I think teachers, uh, a lot of them don't really have an understanding of how to teach and what to teach. And I have that kind of skill level, so I don't mind using it for the good mm -hmm. kids. I have a good time. Billy, how did you first meet Ron? <clears throat> um, 1967, I think with a, a, an organization called the New York Jazz Sextet. I came and I was still in the Army, and I came to sub for a really, really special person named Freddie Waits. Um, and it was more than an honor to be asked. I mean, I was like fledgling. Not that I'm that much farther ahead than I was then, but uh, it was wonderful to just be in the presence of, of all the guys, and which Ron was, of course, included. Uh, and it's like being in a situation where I'm looking at myself going, I can't be, I can't imagine that I'm with these people. Uh, I shouldn't be here yet, because I haven't experienced it yet. And it started out there. Uh, but then browbeat me about things that I needed to know right away. You know, it's like hit the ground running, and you're like, idiot! idiot. <laughs> And it, it, the funny thing about it was that it was all for the right reasons, you know. There was a lot of things that I didn't know. And in those days, being involved in the recording industry uh, as a studio musician, which I thought that that's going to be my life, you know, coming out of the military, I just want to be a studio musician. You know? uh, that's not so easy unless you have, you have to go through those, those schools of hard knocks. And I was prepared for that in my mind. So it wasn't about 
about the words or how it, it was presented to me. It was about what I could learn from it, and the end result is, I, I think, what you see now. And so, you know, without Ron, Roland Hanna, uh, Tom McIntosh, who never really said that much anyway. <laughs> uh, who else is in that band? Oh, well, of course, Mr. Hubert Laws, uh, Jimmy Owens. <coughs> A serious organization with a lot of a lot of experience. You know, and if one didn't take heed, you were well. It could easily have been you. You know, you you, you didn't take heed, and you you'd lose a a, a, a tremendous opportunity to to uh, progress as individual as an individual who learned to work within a group. So for me, that's what I get out of Ron Carter. Believe it or not. Uh, last question: When you th when you think of Ron, where does Ron fit in the constellation of great basis in, in the history of jazz? At this point in time, I have to say he's about the strongest living acoustic bass player around. You know, and uh, that's without any hesitation. You know, um, that's because I think technically that's really what's happening. You know, and that's, that's what he brings to the table. So if you get an opportunity to work with him, more than likely you walk away with uh, much more than you came to the table with. Thank you, gentlemen.